Welcome back to the Lisbon Lifestyle. I'm your host, Igor Kafetz, and today I'm hosting my good friend, Mike Martin, a self-made millionaire, an online entrepreneur, a software creator, and the author of the up-and-coming book that's called In a World Full of Sheep, Fuck You, I'm an Entrepreneur. Oh, and by the way, we will say the word fuck a lot in this episode. So if you've got a problem with us saying the word fuck a lot, uh, then you should probably not listen to it moving forward and skip to the next one or the previous one in the podcast. But today, this is what this episode is all about, because Mike is really, really, really concerned about what kind of people our society is bringing up these days, and he calls them sheep. And that's going to be the main idea for today's episode. We're going to discuss the outrageousness of how of how the society is developing, where are we going as a society, and what can we do about it on an individual level, especially if uh, we are entrepreneurial minded. So, uh, Mike, welcome to the List Building Lifestyle. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers for the intro. <laughs> so, give us, for those who don't know and for those who are looking forward to the release of your book or maybe those who don't know yet, um, give us a quick breakdown of why you wrote In a World Full of Sheep, Fuck You, I'm an Entrepreneur. By the way, great title. Really, really great title. This is the cover. Yeah, well, the, t the title was meant to, to, to catch the right people. I mean, I, I've been doing this for getting on 15 years now. Um, started out as a, a general tradesman out on the road, breaking into houses and cars as a locksmith and over the years realized I couldn't make any money because I didn't know Google Ads. So I learned that, then I learned SEO and so on and so forth. And I spent the last 15 years going from knowing absolutely nothing all the way to the point where now, if we don't do mid seven figures a month, we're kind of depressed, like, whoa, whoa what's going wrong <laughs> type of situation. And, and, and I feel like it's, I feel like the problem is with society in general. I feel like, I feel like everything from, from religion right the way up to politics is kind of designed as a control mechanism to teach people to follow and do as they're told, whether they use your own personal um, fears of, of where you're going to go and sit in the big, the big room upstairs, um, or whether it's a case of if you don't follow suit like this, society is going to look at you and you're going to have a bad status. Um, and what they do is they're trying to develop a world of sheep, a world of people who follow all the rules, do as they're told, finish school, get a nine to five job, um, and literally just help society in general. So, so push everything they do pushes along and helps society, but it doesn't really help them as an individual. Um, and I believe that if people, if I'd have had this book 25 years ago, um, I'd have made millions a hell of a lot quicker because all of the rules I've learned over the last 15 to 20 years of, of making mistakes and making mistakes and losing money and ruining things have been put into this book so that people who, let's say when you leave education, I, I would imagine that the, the majority of people who leave education, they're left in an entrepreneurial position. Yeah. So they're in a position where it's like, right, what the fuck am I going to do next? Yeah, everybody's like at that point where, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to go with this with this life? What, what am I going to do? And I think what happens is most of us try our own thing, try our own thing. And I'll say it from a man's perspective because obviously I'm a guy. And then all of a sudden you get to 25, 30, you get somebody pregnant and it's like, shit, you need to grow up. Now you need to be a parent. So all of a sudden it's like, right, my entrepreneurial dreams are gone. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to get there. And instead now I'm going to go and get a job and make somebody else rich and work for somebody else and kind of follow the, the, the sheep's path because there is nothing designed to teach people to be an entrepreneur step by step by step, like starting right away from mindset and getting all the way to when you, when you do start to make 40, 50, 60 grand a month, how to actually simplify the setup of your business and then enable you to step away while it scales and grows uh, without you. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really needed because most of the people I grew up with were very, very entrepreneurial. We lived on really poor council estates. Nobody had money, so everybody had to be entrepreneurial. And if you wasn't, you had, fuck all, you had absolutely nothing. And the whole point of the book is to really help people who are in that situation be able to pick it up, start in the first chapter, go through and step by step, go through the book whilst they're building their own lives in, in a way that's gonna benefit them, not benefit everybody else. Yeah, and it's interesting on the timing for this book because as we we stepped out of COVID, uh, the world is going through a recession right now. Everyone's you know 
rate rising interest rates and 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 the stock market is in free fall and the whole you know crypto ftx thing and a lot of people losing money uh including tom brady who lost like 100 million but i find the timing of this book interesting because um i've always felt at least in, in the last i'd say five years or so that we've shifted as a society to a, a society that celebrates the entrepreneur in a way, the entrepreneurs are the new rock stars. The people who are celebrated in the media are not the, the Pink Floyds of the world. It's the Elon Musks of the world, people who develop interesting startup ideas and, and whatnot. So um, how do you feel about that in, in terms of like your message uh, and obviously your point of view that's super clear from the book is, is that there's not enough of this. There's not enough um, education. There's not enough tools. There's not enough guidance there's not enough systems uh to help an average person to make the transition do you still feel this way in spite of of the rise of the information marketing space in recent years the rise of the average entrepreneurial um you know drive if you will like a lot of people who work day jobs they still do side hustles um but of course they do it to a certain extent it's not like they go on to explode and build massive companies so talk talk us a little bit about that like What's your uh, point of view about the whole zeitgeist um, these days with regards to entrepreneurial journey? Right. If, if we take it right back, first of all, to what an entrepreneur is. So it, it, in my opinion, society has put the entrepreneur on the pedestal. Right. And if, if you it, if 15 years ago, when I was first kicking off and, and, and trying to become successful, if I had to turn around and said to somebody, I'm an entrepreneur, they'd have been like, well, are you a millionaire? And my answer would have been, no, but I'm an entrepreneur because I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying. And, and I think what people think, entrepreneurs are few and far between. There's not a lot of us. There's not many of us. We don't exist. To, and, and I think the reason the successful entrepreneur has been put on a pedestal is because society doesn't understand what an entrepreneur is. I think probably 60% of society are entrepreneurial, but they don't get it. So instead of, of actually building something and it growing and then becoming successful with it, let's say five times out of 10, they're in a position where 99 times out of 100, they're failing. And they're failing because they don't understand the rules. So what is what happens is we all try different things. We all have our own crazy little business ideas. And we all try and stand on our own two feet when we're young, when we've got nothing to lose until society beats us down into this thing. And because society now looks at an entrepreneur and says, right, well, if you've got a few million sat in the bank. You've got a business where everybody else does everything for you. You spend half of your life sat on a beach, which no entrepreneur in the world really does, right? And and all of these other things, you're an entrepreneur. But the, most of the entrepreneurs, most probably 85, 95% of the world's entrepreneurs are, are struggling, they're skin, they've got no money, and everybody knows them as triers. Like, oh, you've got, God loves a trier. Everybody's heard that saying, God loves a trier. And the thing is, those triers are the entrepreneurs. That doesn't matter if it's your son, it's your daughter, it's, it's, it's your, your, your auntie, your uncle, your, even your parent. They can be constantly trying and failing. There's so many guys I know who have always been trying all their lives to do this and to do this and to do this and keep constantly failing. And as they get into their old, older years, into the 40s, they start to heavily drink. They feel like a failure. They feel like, and, the, and it's not because they're not entrepreneurs. It's not because they're not trying. It's because they don't understand the, the simple, easy step-by-step -step path that takes them from zero to eight, nine, 10, whatever level they want to get it to. Um, it's, it's, it's not all about making loads and loads of money either. A lot of people that are entrepreneurs are focused completely on, on making money. In the last few years, my business, I get up every morning, spend my mornings with my children, take one the, the eldest one to school. I come into the office probably about 10 o'clock. I have my team that do everything that needs to be done and I leave at two. And then I'm at home when the kids get back from school. It's not affected. It's not, it's not saying that because I don't want to trade my time for money anymore. Although I do like to have something that gives me some sort of focus, something to do. So I come into the office for three or four hours a day, not because I have to and not because I won't make money if I do that, but because I feel like you need to be driven with something. Otherwise, you sit at home on a PlayStation all day and <laughs> you turn into a big fat couch potato that really has no drive. Um, so I still do that. I don't work the 15, 16, 17 hour days like I did right at the beginning. But what, what I find is society doesn't understand what an entrepreneur is. And because of that, people who are entrepreneurs are constantly failing. Um, and this book's designed to help those um, people who are constantly failing or, or, or if you buy it for somebody who 
you know that's constantly failing, it will really, really help them figure out the next step in the ladder and for them to take things further. Yeah, just be careful if you buy this book for someone else. Uh, make sure to preface with a good conversation so they don't think you think of them as a sheep. Uh, that's that's really important. Make sure you tell them that you want to give them this book because you think of them as a lion and not as a sheep. And this is the manual to become one. Now, I want to take this conversation into a bit of a different direction. So you mentioned you've got uh, kids, uh, two kids. Uh, I've got a little girl who is four, nearly five, and a little lad who's 11. Nice. Well, I'm in a very similar position. Uh, I got a daughter. She's 10, just turned 10, and my son just turned four. And um, I, I went through this journey, still going through this journey with my daughter, where, um, you know, since moving to Canada from Israel, I, I started looking into the education system. And I, I started looking into public schooling, homeschooling, and private schooling. And um, we did a bit of uh, private schooling first, then COVID hit. So we did a lot of at-home schooling, which is the, um, the era if you will, that where I was the happiest when it came to her uh, education. And now she's back into a, a private Jewish school. And, um, you know, we're doing some extra stuff, obviously, outside of school, too. So I'm putting her through some coding curriculum. She's doing some coding. Um, we're doing um, a lot of um, performance. So she's acting, singing, dancing. Uh, she doesn't really like sports for some reason so there's not you know no sports activities happening uh but there's uh you know there's a lot of that and kind of watching through her development i became extremely picky about the where she gets to spend her time in terms of both education as well as the people that surround her and um what's interesting is that even today even in a world where entrepreneurship is very dominant in the day-to-day -day conversation in the media um, the school system seems like it's it hasn't really progressed since 1924 or something. Because let's take the technology aspect of it. So since about the 80s, up until today, in the last 40 years, the technological leap that we went through as humanity, as society, is absolutely insane. And as we speak uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Chad GPT was released, with which I'm sure you've, you've played with already, and the AI is going to accelerate yep. it even further. And yet, even in a really expensive private school where, you know, uh, my daughter goes, where they treat the school a, a little bit like a startup, you know, they've got a 3D printer and smart boards that connect to a computer and, you know, lots of interesting things. They only spend about one hour a week on the computer on learning, you know, some, you know, something that has to do with a computer. Now, this is a pretty advanced school, like I said, uh, they do a lot of science stuff. They, uh, they, they study on a Chromebook. So they use computers to study, which is a huge, in my, you know, uh, in my opinion, a huge development compared to what all the other schools are doing here. But even, even at that school, they're way behind what's going on. You know, for example, my daughter today in the morning, she was doing homework. She's supposed to write like a report about this charity organization. And I taught her how to use uh, Chad GPT to go and get the Chad GPT technology to go do the research for her. So it can actually give her all the points, et cetera. So she got to do her homework in like five minutes and loved it. <laughs> and somebody would say, well, you're teaching your daughter to take a shortcut. She's not really becoming smarter or whatever. But what I'm saying is we're so we're at a point in our development as a society where going on your own and investing three hours into researching a topic, combining all the different pieces of information, and then coherently expressing it in the, is a, in a report is a scale of the previous century. So my question to you: How do you like? How do you? What's your point of view about the education system in general? Like, this is my point of view. I'm really unhappy about it. I really think they're they're dropping the ball, and I really think they're like stuck in the Stone Age. You've got to look at it. Firstly, they probably have to look at it from a teacher's perspective. Now, if a teacher knew what we know, they wouldn't be a teacher <laughs> because they get paid hardly any money. We probably make more every month than they make every year, if not every week. <laughs> So it's kind of a situation where if they knew what we know, they couldn't. So they can't really teach it. But I get, I get what you're saying about, I mean, 
Um, we was at parents evening a few months back um, and one of the teachers said, yeah, you need to work really, really hard um, so that when, when you get old, you can get good qualifications and you can get a good job. And well, I, in front it. of my son, I explained to the, yes, to, to my son, oh and my I God. said, N uh, no. And I, I, I turned around and said, that, that's, that's untrue. I said, he needs to learn to work hard off his own back so that he can be a success when he grows up. He doesn't necessarily need to go and get a job. Um, and he, and my, my missus was looking at me as if like, you can't really say that, but I, I'm completely open about this to anybody who will listen that, look, you're completely wrong. I don't want my kid to grow up and work his ass off to get qualifications that he's never going to use and then become like you. Um, teacher, not you, because <laughs> you're obviously doing what I do, but uh, to, to become like the teacher or like uh, like the person stuck in the shelves in Tesco or uh, the taxi driver or, or the lorry driver. I want him to grow up and become... Um, a success in his own right, somebody who controls his own destiny and somebody who, who understands that the work ethic is the most important thing because you've got to work hard, but not only do you need to work hard, you need to focus, but you don't need to focus. Like a few years back when I first figured out how to dominate the internet online, okay, for, for, for my local businesses at Locksmith, um, I, I sat and literally for months built tens of thousands of pages, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And I kept building these pages and eventually I ended up with over 200 guys on national basis working for me, all, all the subcontractors, and we was doing about 150 grand a month. And I thought, this is absolutely amazing. Fast forward two years, if I'd have figured that strategy out, the first thing I would have done is gone and found some developers and said, right, this is what I wanna do, and I need you to build this for me in the next six months so that I can do what would have taken me a year in one day. And that's exactly what I did years later, and now we turned that into a software, and that software has now got several thousand monthly subscription uh, buyers who pay us every single month to use the software which I designed to build my business. So the shortcut side of things, I think is, is brilliant because if you teach somebody, right, you've got to work hard and you've got to focus, but you've got to focus the right way. So if there's a shortcut that can be taken, then focus on the shortcut and, 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 and cut that work, that work level in half. Too many people want to trade time for money and, and, and it's completely wrong. If, if the more time you're spending to make money, the less opportunities you've got to be able to grow and scale. And it's all about automation. So like you just said with the um, with, with your daughter and, and um, the chat GPT, it's why would you do the, the I mean, I've got a, a thing, called, it's called Word Tune Read that I use. So whenever somebody sends me something to read, I, I open the URL in that. And what it does is it pulls out all the key points. So it'll basically pull out all the key points from the page that somebody sent me. And I'd be able to read like five paragraphs for 3000 word article, because it's usually only got five to 10 key points that are important and the rest is just gibberish. Um, and it's kind of the same thing. Anything that saves time enables you to spend more time on doing something that's gonna make money. So as, as far as the school system, yes, I think it's, it's set in the stone ages and I don't see it changing anytime soon, unless they turn around and say to people like me or like you or like other successful entrepreneurs that, okay, um, Here's, here's half a million dollars a year as a teacher and the government's never going to agree that. So they're never going to learn what it is we do. Um, and I just can't see how it'll ever evolve into that because the people who know what we know can potentially t do 50 to 100 grand a month doing very, very little. So why would you go and do a job that's super stressful, put up with loads of kids that's going to give you loads of earache and stress and then have to go and mark 50 different work teeth every single day? It doesn't make sense to me so so i can't see how it's going to progress to that but it has to eventually somehow well i i don't think it will ever be that way i think for the most part schools will be built um there were actually like the concept of this of a school originates back in prussia which is what germany used to be called or or, or something if my memory serves me right and they were built this this model of a school was built to get soldiers to, to build a, a, a generation of soldiers. And so if you look at the way the school is and the kind of qualities it cultivates in a child on an individual level um, and the way it teaches the child, you see how that is true because I, I'm, I've got army, I've got military experience. I served for many, many years in the Israeli uh, Air Force. So I got to kind of taste the world of what you would call like a, a sheep world, because as a soldier, you're not allowed to think, you're not allowed to make decisions. You, you know, if somebody told you to stand right here, 
if you just take take a step right or take a step left or jump that's like a a violation you know so you have to literally stand there and not move your ass so if you look at a school a school is exactly like that they want all the kids to sit down and listen and not really ask questions for the most part the good teachers actually encourage their children in the class to ask questions then they teach them to memorize stuff they don't teach them to think which is my biggest problem with schools that is they really don't teach them how to think and the only school in my area where i felt that they're actually encouraging uh, kids to think critically was this school where i ended up taking my daughter to because you know i actually went on a school tour a school tour and uh i started like i i went into like a class and i started watching and seeing what's going on and you see the teachers having a dialogue with the kids and he's posing questions and he's asking questions and they're asking questions there's actual critical thinking you know um i used to have a, a sign in my home office back in israel if everyone thinking if everyone is thinking the same way no one is thinking but that's exactly what happens yep. in a traditional environment where, you know, you're basically being told how to think. You're not being encouraged to solve problems. I think entrepreneurs, by their nature, are problem solvers. They're really ambitious problem solvers. They're not happy with the status quo. And most great entrepreneurial stories usually track back to a person who was unhappy about a status quo in a certain industry in a certain way. Right, just like you were unhappy about something in your life that led you to starting a business. So the other thing that I really want to see uh, happening more and more in our society, especially when it comes to children, is they really need to focus more on self-development principles than they do on math and you know how to use a calculator to calculate a square root of whatever. Uh, because kids come out of school, they have zero understanding how the real world works, and they have zero tools to deal with the with the actual harshness of life because everyone's now a snowflake they get offended about everything oh you're making work too hard oh i showed up for work high and you can't fire me because that's the violation of my rights you know all that nonsense if i showed to work showed up to work high when i was uh you know uh washing dishes at burger king i would be kicked out and i didn't want to be kicked out i needed the money so I learned how to be effective, how to show up on time, showed some discipline. And yes, I had to do some some really you know difficult and dirty starter jobs, but they made me into a better man and made me appreciate certain things about my life today. And uh, especially they made me appreciate systems, which is what entrepreneurs are good at. Something you also talk about in your book where entrepreneur, like you said, you're not going to go and create a thousand pages with content. You're going to figure out a way to create a system that spits out 10,000 pages of content without you having to do the actual work of creating the pages of content. And that's a key difference in how someone like you and someone who works a day job think. And if anyone ever wonders about why a CEO of a big company gets paid 100 times more money than the average employee in that same company, this is why. Because they can be critical thinkers, they can problem solve, and they can create systems that have a much larger impact than an effort of one employee in that company. If somebody's been working at a factory and been tightening this screw like that for the last 20 years, <laughs> and they're not more effective tightening that screw today than they were 20 years ago, they should not be getting a raise. They don't deserve a raise. But if they came up with a way to tighten that screw with one move so they can tighten 20 more screws in the same hour, then that person should get a raise. And that's the difference, in my opinion, how an entrepreneur thinks and a non-entrepreneur thinks. Do you, do you think that that can be learned? Because I do think that can be learned. And I think a lot of people, like, like you were saying earlier about the sheep mentality, about schools, it's a control mechanism. And when everything around you is set up to control you to go in one specific direction, it's human nature not to think and just to do as you're told. But I believe almost anybody can learn to become a much more efficient thinker and, and can start looking at things from a bigger perspective um, rather than just thinking to themselves, this is how it's done. Forget about it. There's no point thinking about it. This is how it's done. This is how they've always done it. I'm just going to carry and do it. But there are people like that who are happy to do that. Um, and I know a lot of people that are like that where it's like, I don't care. I just want to get paid at the end of the week and get pissed on a weekend. Um, but there's no, 
there's a few, it's good for society that there's people like that otherwise because we need more of those people in society than than we do entrepreneurs and that's probably why school is going to remain like it is because they want to build people with a sheep mentality who will follow that we can have one leader that can tell them what to do and, and then everybody's just gonna be like a herd and do as they're told um but i believe anybody even those that are not like that naturally can actually learn to be like that because if they taught it in school we would have more entrepreneurs than we'd know what to do with. And I think that's a real tragedy. First of all, I agree with you. I do believe that every single person on this planet can learn to think in a problem-solving manner. I don't think you can teach to think in the way that Steve Jobs thinks or Elon Musk thinks. I think you can model that a little bit, but I don't think you can teach that. But, I, but these guys are not problem solvers. Because the Musks and the and the Jobses of the world, they don't just solve a problem. They create a whole new capability. And that's like something you can't teach. You don't meet people like that too often. But a, but a hardcore entrepreneur, and this is what I consider myself to be, right? Um, I, I never really worked with you shoulder to shoulder to know just your level of, of uh, entrepreneurial thinking. But my level is pretty much problem solving. I can solve a problem that's right in front of me. I can't create like a new level of capability. So in other words, if I have a broken MP3 player, I can fix it, but I won't create the iPod. That's really not my uh, not my forte, if you know what I mean. So, but the problem solving is definitely a learnable skill. And, and, and I'm a great example to that simply because being spending my, my whole life, conscious life in the army, and I don't know if you knew this about me, I actually went to religious school. When I moved from Ukraine to Israel, my parents sent me to a school called Shuvu, which was a religious school for immigrant children where the uh, Israeli uh, uh, religious group, they were trying to like recruit uh, the newcomers and may turn them into a religious people. So I used to pray twice a day, uh, I would put on the tefillin, which is the thing you put in your head and on your arm. So I was like really, really into it. But uh, and then I went to an Israeli Air Force Academy, uh, you know, and learned studied there for like six years. And then I enrolled, enlisted in the Israeli Air Force. So I was like a very I was this I was a sheep, man. I was like and I was happy too. I really liked the idea of fitting in. But then at some point, the yeah. Red Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then Cashflow Quadrant, and that changes everything. Because, and this is the greatest thing, I think school has to get Robert Kiyosaki's books, make it a part of the curriculum, and make them read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the Cashflow Quadrant. Because what you described, the process of having, have, having built thousands of pages and then realizing, wait a second, this is not efficient. Let me go build a software that build these pages for me. Not only it'll build the pages for me in my niche, but I also have 3,000 other people pay me a monthly subscription fee uh, for using my software. Well, I kick back and do nothing or at least go work on some other project, which I know that's what you do. You don't just, you know, kick back and scratch your balls all day. You know, you're much more hardworking than that. Yeah. Uh, so so in, in Cashflow Quadrant is where this exact thing is described. The story of uh, of a guy who wanted to bring water to the village and you know he basically t he starts you know making rounds goes to the river comes back with buckets and then when the demand grows he gets his son to join him and now they're going together back and forth to the river while some other guy kind of this guy like you I'm pretty sure his name was Mike as well, even though it's a made up story, but let's call him Mike. So some other Mike, you know, he basically lives in that village. He looks at the guy who's constantly bringing in the water and uh, he's like, oh, okay. And he spends the next year building a pipeline. He just builds this pipeline all the way to the river that, you know, gets the water automatically. So he then stands next to the tap and he opens the tap for people and collects the money or whatever. And so the, the irony of this, story is not only Mike makes more money, but Mike doesn't really work all that hard. And when the old man who's ca still carrying the water using the buckets with his son, he can't really carry that water fast enough. There's simply, I mean, it's, it's a human body and its ability to withstand pain and effort uh, that, that's competing against an automation like a pipeline. If you really think about it, it's not a fair fight. So not only you're becoming more efficient, you're becoming richer, you're solving a problem for other people, and you don't need to work all that hard. So you basically get to have your cake and eat it too. And, you know, and uh, it's just the way entrepreneurs truly get rich, exactly what you've done. So look, we can talk on and on about just, this. 
what you've just said there, let me just bring okay. to, just mention something, right? So you brought something up, that story, right? So like I was saying to you earlier, critical thinking, right? And how to think big and, and, and how to become entrepreneurial can be learned by anybody, right? But you know, the hardest skill and the, and the pipeline was an exact, exact, like it, it was like, it was the perfect story for it, right? A lot of people can learn to think big, right? And you, you'll understand this from, from I know I know tons of entrepreneurs like this and you all know loads, but they're no good at thinking long term, right? Mm. So they want to jump onto onto these different promotions, into into these different setups, and they're thinking to themselves, right, boom, I can make twenty five grand this week off this. Whereas I'd think to myself, right, I can make five grand off this this week, and then I'm going to make five grand next month, and five grand next month, and five grand next month, and I'm going to build something long term, right? And and with that pipeline, what you were saying there, he didn't just think big, he didn't just think outside the box, but he was thinking about the hardest thing for any entrepreneur to learn is to not just think big, but to think long term. And still now, and, and I talk, I must talk to 150 different entrepreneurs every single month, right? And probably 95%, if not more, are still short-term thinkers. Even though they think big, they make lots of money, they make millions every single year, but next year they're still going to have to work because like you said earlier about systems, they're not thinking long term. They're not looking at this and saying, if I create this, it's still going to generate me money in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time and I'm going to build it once they're still working towards that 997 <laughs> and things like that. That, 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 that and, and that story was brilliant. As soon as you said it, it was like, you've just hit the nail on the head of what the most difficult thing for an entrepreneur to learn. And I think the time you learn it is when it gets to the point where you've got a few million sat in the bank, you've bought your house, you've paid it off, you've paid, you've paid for your cars, your kids' schools and tuitions and college and all that. But when it's like, right, I no longer need money. Then you start thinking long-term naturally. But if you can learn to think long term, like Jeff Bezos did right at the beginning, you can get to the point where you're making 10 times more money than you can ever imagine and working 10 percent of what you ever thought. You know, uh, I, I really think it's impossible for most people to do. And I'll share my own experience about that. Um, it took me I, maybe I started thinking long term, maybe five years ago, man. Um, but before, um, it was never like that. It was going from one winner to another. It was hoping to hit one jackpot today and then another one tomorrow. And everything was, like you said, short-term thinking. And looking back now, I realize why that happens. I, that happens because coming, usually great entrepreneurs start out poor. It's true for you. It's true for me. It's true for most people we know. Almost no great entrepreneur starts out really, really rich. And uh, that whoever believes that idea, by the way, is just misled, horribly, horribly misled. Most people get into entrepreneurship not because they're trying to change the world. It's because they really want to make some some real money and not to have to have a boss who is uh, usually not as intelligent as they are and not good people. But, you know, regardless, you get into entrepreneurship or start your own business uh, for reasons that are primarily monetary and with it with this comes another fear the fear of being without money again the fear of poverty and that fear is so dominant that fear is so prevalent that fear is so gripping that even after you've made your first million you still can't really believe it you're like still going for the next winner trying to write the next campaign build the next winning software get the next promotion going because again, I don't know if this is true for you, Matt, but for me, it's so true because there's this wolf and it's chasing me and that wolf is here to take everything I've got. So every morning I wake up and I wake up as if I'm poor. And that's been the reality of the first seven, maybe nine years of my journey. It's been subsiding in recent years. So it, it created the possibility and the mental bandwidth to think longer term. But I think in many ways, I still suffer from it. Uh, and I spoke about this on this podcast many times too. This idea of I'm not really rich, that I'm still poor in my mind, that's, what few, that's what's fueling the short-term thinking. Yep, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think I was forced into long-term thinking. When I, when I first, um, I came back from London um, and I needed to start another business. So I went and got a job at a, a call center and I started teaching myself to pick locks at my desk, right? And um, once I, once 
and everyone was like, are you fucking mad? Are you not coming to the pub with us at dinner? And I'm like, no, no, I'm learning to pick locks. I'm going to set up a locksmith company. And everyone's like, he's fucking stupid, right? So I'd sit there, probably three months, I'd learn to pick locks, different padlocks, different locks, start picking locks at my desk at dinner time. And then as soon as I thought, right, I can pick any lock. So I started advertising. And um, so I, I goes to, so I started advertising on Google Ads. Um, and the first the first job that came in, I said, right, I quit. Right, it was like, what are you doing? I was like, I've got a job. I've just quoted 140 quid. I'm going to go and do it. I wasn't getting paid that a day. So I, I was going. So it turns up at his house with a set of lock picks and his door mechanism on a PVC door had jammed. And I was like, I turned up, I was like, so I can't pick the lock. He's not lost his key. And I was like, shit. So I phoned the guy at the suppliers because I'd sorted that out. And he taught me through exactly how to break into this, um, into this house. Anyway, from there, <laughs> I, I, I kind of fell in love with it. I was like, I, I need to now know how to um, break into everything and do everything. So I focused on it for the next year and I ended up with over 200 guys on a national basis taking work off me and we were doing 150 grand a month, right? But the, the biggest problem with locksmithing is if you've ever locked yourself out and it's cost you a couple of hundred quid to get in, you never lock yourself out ever again, right? So there's no repeat business. Yeah. So even though I'd do 150 grand in, in month one, Month two, I was hitting zero. And then I'm looking at it saying, fuck, I've got 30 or 40 grams of overheads that I have to make before. So I was always stressed and I was always worried and I was always. So as soon as I started to transition into software, instantly I was like, right, monthly subscriptions. You know, I'm, I'm going to, it cost me 30 or 40K to build something. So then as soon as that was done, I was like, right, next step for me is I'm going to move into monthly subscriptions and I'm going to build the business on the long term. So everybody that gets involved is paying me every single month because I'd been so stressed for that many years <laughs> with everyone locks itself out once and it's like, they're never going to do it again. So you never get any repeat business. It was, um, and I didn't want contracts because I didn't want a boss. No, so I wouldn't work for contracts, sense. but I wouldn't like. No, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and again, no, was... once again, we see this thread of, you know, being unhappy with the status quo. So even after you broke through your, you know, your 100K in a single month, you know, still you then being an entrepreneur, you look at the status quo with this new set of eyes and you're like, okay, now I don't like this part about it. So I'm going to go fix that. And you end up building a thriving software business with dozens and dozens of software products and thousands of people, tens of thousands of people paying you a monthly fee, which means every time, every morning when you wake up, before you even put on your slippers, you already had several thousand dollars probably coming into your bank account overnight because of the rebuilds that are coming in. So it's an amazing position to be in and uh, really, really big, uh, big thumbs up, big kudos, you know, high five for your success, man. So guys, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like Mike and what he talks about and his vision, then I urge you to go ahead and get a copy of this book in a world of, in a world full of sheep, Fuck You, I'm an Entrepreneur by Mike Martin. You can get it on Amazon. You can Google it. You can use the link in the description. If you're listening on YouTube, you can use the link in the show notes. If you go to our website at listbuildinglifestyleshow.com. Or uh, if you want to get it directly from Mike himself, maybe there's a website where uh, they can go. Fuckyoubooks.com. <laughs> wow, what a great domain. <laughs> what a great domain. Yeah. Nice. All right, so... You heard the man. Um, get the book. It's really, really cool, especially if you're thinking about getting into entrepreneurship, you're thinking about getting uh, getting started as your, in your own business, but you're still not sure, you know, what's the first step, where to go, where to get started. And um, again, look up Mike Martin online and on social media and get his book. And I've had a true pleasure um, having a chat with you today. Thank you so much. And until next time we chat, have a good one.